This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. The insertion of a pleural chest tube is often done in a setting where immediate action is required. Nonetheless, adherence to sterility, analgesia, sound technique, and safety are always warranted. The most common indications for chest tube drainage are pneumothorax that is recurrent, persistent, under tension, or bilateral, any pneumothorax in a patient on positive pressure ventilation, hemothorax, recurrent or symptomatic large pleural effusion, empyema, and chylothorax. There are relative contraindications, mainly based on hematologic abnormalities, such as bleeding diatheses or coagulopathy. Blood products or coagulation factors may need to be transfused in order to reduce the risk of bleeding during the procedure. The procedure should be explained and consent obtained whenever possible from the patient or next of kin. A chest x-ray should be performed when possible prior to the chest tube insertion. Sterilized and fully prepared chest tube trays are often available in the hospital. The key materials required in addition are a sterile gown, mask, and gloves, sterile drapes or towels, local anesthetics such as 1% lidocaine, chlorhexidine cleaning solution and sterile pieces of gauze, 25 and 21 gauge needles, 10 cc and 20 cc syringes, a scalpel with size 11 blade, which should be on the chest tube tray, at least four or five dissecting instruments, such as Kelly curved clamps or artery forceps, which should also be found on the chest tube tray, non-absorbable strong sutures of size 1.0 or greater made of silk or nylon, a chest tube of appropriate size, a sterile drainage system, and dressings for the tube after insertion. The chest tube is sized according to its internal diameter. The length of the tube is marked with numbers to indicate distance into the chest wall. Additionally, there are several drainage holes at the distal end. A radio-opaque stripe runs along the length of the tube and outlines the most proximal drainage hole. This is used to confirm correct placement of the chest tube in the pleural space on a chest x-ray. Choosing the size of chest tube is based on the indications for the tube. In the case of a large pneumothorax in a clinically stable, spontaneously breathing patient, chest tubes with an internal diameter of 16 to 22 French may be placed. In a patient with a large pneumothorax who is clinically unstable, the same rules for chest tube sizes apply. However, if the patient has underlying lung disease, requires mechanical ventilation, or is anticipated to have a large air leak, larger tubes from size 24 to 28 French are recommended. In order to drain a viscous hemothorax or empyema, or to evacuate a pneumothorax in a patient receiving mechanical ventilation, larger diameter tubes sized 28 to 32 French are more often employed. Newer evidence favors the insertion of smaller size 10 to 14 French catheters, or pigtail drains, for the drainage of pneumothoraces in clinically stable patients, and for malignant pleural effusions. This is done using a Seldinger technique with a guide wire and often with ultrasound guidance. This technique differs from that used for larger chest tubes and will not be discussed further in this video. Once the chest tube tray is open and all the key instruments are identified, occlude the proximal free end of the chest tube with a clamp or forceps. Next, with another clamp or forceps, grasp the distal end of the tube. This will aid in passing the tube through the tract. The patient should be positioned either supine or in the semi-recumbent position. The ipsilateral arm may be maximally abducted to the side of the patient or, alternatively, positioned behind the patient's head in order to have optimal exposure of the insertion site. The ideal location for the placement of a chest tube is in the triangle of safety, the anatomical region defined by the lateral border of the pectoralis major muscle anteriorly the mid-axillary line posteriorly, which is also the anterior aspect of the latissimus dorsi, 
the apex just below the axilla, and the horizontal level of the nipple inferiorly. The nipple line may be an unreliable landmark for female patients due to breast tissue. To help with landmarking, remember that the triangle of safety should approximately lie between the fourth and fifth intercostal space in the anterior axillary line. Start your landmarking by localizing the clavicle. Next, count the rib numbers as your fingers traverse down the anterior chest wall. Once the correct intercostal space is found, move your hand along the space laterally towards the anterior axillary line. The incision will be made here. The chest tube will actually be inserted one interspace above this point. Mark the incision spot with the imprint of the back of a needle or a pen marking. Once full barrier precautions are employed, use the chlorhexidine cleaning solution and sterile gauze to create a large sterile field on the patient's skin. Cover the field with sterile drapes so that only the procedure site is exposed. Adequate analgesia is a very important step in this procedure as chest tube insertions can often be very painful for the patient. The skin, subcutaneous tissues, deeper tissue layers, parietal pleura, and periosteal surface of the rib below the intended insertion site must be generously anesthetized. Using the smallest gauge needle, create a wheel of anesthetic in the skin overlying the landmark spot. Using the larger needle, anesthetize the subcutaneous skin layers through the wheel, aspirating as the needle moves deeper. Anesthetize the periosteum of the rib that lies below the intercostal space where the tube will be inserted. Once the parietal pleura is encountered, a flash of pleural fluid will fill the syringe if a pleural collection is being evacuated. If a pneumothorax is being drained, the syringe may only fill with air as the needle enters the pleural space. Withdraw the needle, aspirating along the entire path. Make an incision approximately 1.5 to 2 centimeters in length above and parallel to the anesthetized rib. Introduce the curved dissecting instrument, such as a Kelly clamp, into the incision. Begin dissecting the subcutaneous tissues in order to reach the intercostal muscles. After dissecting through the subcutaneous tissues, stay on top of the rib to guide the blunt dissection. This will create a diagonal path towards the correct intercostal space. When using a larger chest tube of sizes 24 French or greater, use your index finger to explore the tract being created by blunt dissection. This is done to ensure the larger caliber tube will be able to pass through the tract. Once you have dissected through the subcutaneous tissues and deeper intercostal muscle layers, you will encounter the parietal pleura. Push the clamp gently through the parietal pleura. The entry into the pleural space through the parietal pleura is felt as a give or a sudden release of resistance. Alternatively, you may use your finger to penetrate through to the pleural space. Once the pleural space is entered, use your index finger to ensure the lung is not adherent to the chest wall, which may impede passage of the tube into the pleural space. Often, pleural fluid will trickle out through the tract, further confirming entry into the pleural space. Pass the tube through the incision, unclamp the jaws of the Kelly, and then direct the tube through the tract slowly using your finger as a guide. If the tube is meant to evacuate a pneumothorax, aim it apically towards the top of the lung. If the indication is to drain fluid, aim it basally towards the bottom of the lung. Make note of the depth the tube has passed by keeping track of the numerical markings on the side of the tube. Secure the chest tube to the skin using the heavy sutures. Simple interrupted or mattress sutures are often satisfactory to ensure stability of the tube and avoidance of air leaks around the tube. The free ends of the sutures are wrapped around the tube and tied multiple times to secure it in place. Purse string sutures are not recommended as they yield poor cosmetic results and increase the risk of skin necrosis. Once the chest tube has been secured, a petroleum-based gauze dressing should be wrapped around it. 
Apply several pieces of sterile gauze around the tube. Secure the site with multiple pressure dressings. A chest x-ray must be done to confirm correct placement. On an x-ray, the radio-opaque stripe is visible with an interruption indicating the position of the proximal hole. This hole must be within the pleural space. Otherwise, it is sitting outside the pleura and not draining effectively. This is an indication to replace the tube altogether. Do not advance the tube into the chest, as this can introduce non-sterile tubing into the chest cavity. Before unclamping the free end of the chest tube, firmly connect it to the sterile drainage system. Now unclamp the free end. If pleural fluid is being drained, the fluid level in the drainage system will rise. If a pneumothorax is being evacuated, air bubbles will appear. Do not reclamp the chest tube while there is bubbling. This may lead to recollection of a pneumothorax and may even result in a tension pneumothorax. Most commercially available drainage systems use the three bottle model of closed drainage and suction. The most important bottle is the underwater seal, which serves as a one-way valve that allows air and fluid to leave the pleural cavity without the risk of re-entry during inspiration. All available pleural drainage systems contain the underwater seal bottle. Bubbling may be seen in this bottle. This will indicate whether there is an ongoing air leak either from the patient or from the system itself. The two other bottles that may be present in the drainage system are a collection bottle connected directly to the patient for accumulation of pleural fluid and or debris, and a suction system that connects to wall suction but regulates the amount of suction actually delivered to the pleural space via a column of sterile water. Suction may be applied if there is a persistent pneumothorax despite the underwater seal or if a viscous pleural collection is not draining effectively. When evacuating chronic large pleural effusions, the risk of re-expansion pulmonary edema has been well described. A stepwise approach to the drainage of chronic large pleural effusions is recommended, not exceeding 1 to 1.5 liters within a 30-minute period. The pleural drainage system must be kept approximately 40 inches below the patient in order to prevent retrograde flow of air or fluid back into the pleural space. There are complications associated with the insertion of a chest tube. These include bleeding and hemothorax, traumatic perforation of the lung, heart chambers, diaphragm, or intraabdominal organs, intercostal neuralgia due to trauma of the intercostal neurovascular bundle, intermittent blocking of the tube with clot or debris, subcutaneous emphysema, Re-expansion pulmonary edema due to more than 1 to 1.5 liters of fluid drainage in less than 30 minutes. Infection of the drain site and empyema. The timing of chest tube removal depends on the indications for the chest tube. In the case of a pneumothorax, bubbling must have ceased, the patient stabilized clinically, and the lung re-expanded on a chest x-ray as minimal criteria to remove the tube. If suction is being applied to evacuate the pneumothorax, most clinicians perform a trial of underwater seal alone in order to ensure there is no further bubbling with the suction turned off. Most physicians will perform a chest x-ray 12 to 24 hours after the last evidence of an air leak prior to removing the tube. The decision to clamp the chest tube to check for a persistent air leak is one that is practitioner dependent, and there is insufficient data to support or refute this practice. If the chest tube was placed to drain pleural fluid, once the drainage volume is less than 200 cc in a 24-hour period and the fluid is serous, the tube may be removed. If a chest tube was placed for empyema, removal of the tube should be considered only after the patient has stabilized clinically and the drainage criteria are met. If an air leak is persistent or the pleural fluid drainage criteria are not met, a pulmonary specialist or thoracic surgeon should be consulted for more definitive, potentially surgical management. Pneumothorax risk is no different after chest tube removal during end inspiration versus end expiration. Once the sutures are removed, instruct an awake patient to hold his or her breath either after a full inspiration or full expiration or while performing a Valsalva maneuver. Pull the tube at end expiration if a patient is being mechanically ventilated. Ideally, two clinicians should be present during tube removal. Once the tube is removed, 
quickly seal the incision site with a petroleum-based gauze, reinforced with several pieces of regular gauze on top of it. Secure the site with a pressure dressing. Additional sutures may be required to close the incision. A follow-up chest x-ray should be obtained 12 to 24 hours after the tube has been removed. Closely inspect for any suggestion of a new pneumothorax. Caution must be exercised when removing a chest tube from any patient on a mechanical ventilator, especially in those with high oxygen or positive pressure requirements, chronic lung disease, or other risks for recurrent pneumothorax. Experienced physicians should supervise the decision to remove the tube in these cases. The insertion of a chest tube is often done under extremely critical circumstances. However, using the appropriate techniques and sterile precautions will ensure safe and efficient performance.